for joining us for a discussion on the story of plastic. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Molly Hayslip. I'm the program manager at Baltimore College Town Network. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that brings 13 colleges and universities together to attract, engage, and retain students and also staff and raise the profile of Baltimore as being a great college town. Uh, so we work to provide events like these to initiate conversation and collaboration. And I just wanted to give a special thank you to our sustainability campus partners at UMBC, Hopkins and Towson University for coming up with this great idea and helping it to come to fruition. So I'm definitely excited for tonight's discussion and um, kind of without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our student moderators to kind of take it from here. So again, thank you all and welcome. Hi, everybody, and welcome again. Uh, my name is Kiara Perry, and I'm currently a junior anthropology major at Towson University. My name is Masha Ahmed. I'm a student at Johns Hopkins University studying behavioral biology. Hi, I'm Alicia Sabatino, and I'm a geography master's student at UMBC. All right, so uh, as Molly said, today we'll be discussing the story of plastic, which is a documentary that examines the plastic pollution crisis and its global effect. Um, so for our discussion, we've invited a couple panelists, and I'd like uh, the panelists to introduce themselves as I call out their names. Uh, so first we have Delegate Brooke Learman. Hi everybody, great to be with you here tonight. Thanks so much for having me. I'm a delegate representing District 46 in the Maryland General Assembly, which includes um, all of the neighborhoods around the water uh, in Baltimore City from the Dundalk County line, all of Southeast as far North as Orleans, South Baltimore Peninsula, over the Hanover Street Bridge, Cherry Hill, Westport, Lakeland, Brooklyn, Curtis Bay. So it's great to be with you here tonight. This is a, a subject that is near and dear to my heart. Thank you for having me. And next we have uh, Tara Thompson, a zero waste, oh, I'm sorry, a South Baltimore community activist. Hi, my name is Tara Thompson. I'm a youth leader with Free Your Voice and a community organizer with the South Baltimore Community Land Trust. Uh, we fight for clean air, zero waste and affordable housing. Awesome, thank you so much for the introduction. We would love to get started by posing a question to both of our panelists. And while our panelists are responding, if anyone um, here today have any questions or follow up, please feel free to type it into the chat box. We will open up uh, the discussion towards an audience led Q&A towards the end of the conversation. So there's always that option as well. Uh, so for our first question to all the audience, uh, all the panelists, my bad. Uh, there are seemingly obstacles at every turn to moving our communities towards zero waste, whether they be financial, political, or social. I think it can be quite disheartening for many people to see that. How do you stay hopeful with the fight to zero waste while noticing this discrepancy? And if, um, yeah, Delegate Lehrman, if you can get me go. Okay, sure. Um, well, Tariq is you know, doing amazing on the ground work. Honestly, part of the reason I'm hopeful is because of people like Tariq and for your voice um, and the young people who are so involved. But um, that is a huge piece of what we are seeing, uh, why we're starting to see movement on these issues. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background, um, I was elected in 2014 and took office in January 2015, and the first bill I filed was a plastic bag ban. Uh, I had been door knocking in Cherry Hill when I was running for office, and I had rounded a corner, and I remember it very clearly, seeing uh, homes, road, green trees and then water and where the green and trees were, it looked like a semi-trailer, like a huge truck had just unloaded thousands of single use plastic bags. There were so many of them. And um, I just, I sort of lost it. I was so angry um, and was just so frustrated. And the image really stayed with me. And, you know, just living in downtown Baltimore, living in the city, working downtown, I see every day single use objects, you know, plastic bags, cups, styrofoam containers, you know, I was seeing them all over. And and I, it, it, it's not something I wanted to see. And it's also not something I thought any kids should be raised around, right? It's super damaging for the water, but also incredibly 
um, disheartening to see in your neighborhood um, just trash everywhere. And so much of it is single use trash and it's supposed to be disposable, right? It was made to be disposed um, because over the past several decades, our packaging industry um, because of cheap oil and petroleum has sort of led the charge on creating a more disposable uh, lifestyle and pushed that on us. Um, so I uh, introduced that bill, plastic bag ban in 2015 for the first time, and it went nowhere in 2015, in 2016. Um, and, you know, I called uh, the chairman of the committee and I said, look, is this, is this ever going to move? You know, I don't want to keep doing this. To me, it seems like common sense. And he was like, yeah, try something else. And so then I moved to styrofoam. <laughs> um, and I said, okay, like if we can't get rid of plastic bags yet, can we at least get rid of styrofoam? Again, 2017, I introduced it with Senator Cheryl Kagan, who was fantastic, uh, fantastic cross file, went nowhere in 2018, it went nowhere. And then something happened. Um, and I'm not ex exactly sure how or why it happened. But in the spring of 2018, something shifted in the narrative in Maryland, and I think really across the country, where we saw a shift in attitudes towards single-use plastic and single-use waste. Um, I think of the National Geographic cover um, with the iceberg that's a plastic bag underneath as a huge um, as almost an omen for where we were going. Um, but I think it was just more and more news stories about plastics and single use plastics and the visuals that were coming out of like dying animals and the fact that all of this waste was going somewhere and we just weren't seeing it, but it was impacting real people and their lives in countries around the world um, where we were sending our waste and something shifted. And I had a lot of talks with leadership that interim, and we were able to pass the styrofoam ban in 2019. Um, and after that, I think there's no looking back now. So I feel really hopeful about zero waste and single use plastics. And, um, and I think that we just have to keep pushing because we are now to a point where people are, are really understanding how bad thing, these things are. Um, and a lot of that is because of Tariq and people like you on this call. So thank you. Sorry, that was so long. <laughs> thank you so much. Tariq, we would love to hear from you next. Okay, hi. So what keeps me hopeful is, is my predecessors, not predecessors, but the ones that come before me um, and free your voice, they were the ones who got rid of the proposal for the world's largest incinerator, which was going to be built less than a mile away from where I live at now. So that just would have been, that would have been the largest, I believe in the country, I think. Um, so they were the ones who got rid of that and learned about their stories when I was, when I was still in school, taking this, uh, taking the class to be, to become a person who, in, who, you know, someone who fights for zero waste and everything. Um, it was, it, it was nice to see that all the all the all, all the accomplishments that they've done, um, and also just to look at how much these things connect to my personal life, such as asthma, um, affordable housing, and everything. When it comes to this, um, so you know, just having these types of connections and knowing that I can make a change is something that keeps me hopeful. Thank you. Uh, if the, if we do have any students from from Cal Prague, we would love to hear from you next. Please feel free to jump in. Totally fine. <laughs> we will move on to uh, individual questions right now. So our first question is to Delegate Learman. Uh, what strat strategies, if any, has the state or city proposed to deal with COVID-19 and the increase of medical waste and disposal of single waste plastic? Um, it's a good question. So I'm going to start with the uh, single use plastics. At the city level, we have a great Office of Sustainability. Um, you know, they are really trying to think through and push DPW and others on a zero waste plan, moving away from incineration, um, and how we get there in the quickest way, right? They set up composting collections at all of the uh, farmers markets until COVID hit. Um, they're trying to encourage and work with some of our small compost developers um, 
And I know um, for your voice, um, Tariq and others attend some of their sustainability commission meetings to talk. Um, so I, I, I really salute our Baltimore Office of Sustainability. I think they're doing really good work and they're trying to be proactive and progressive. Um, at the state level um, for single use plastics, we passed the plastic bag ban last year through the House of Delegates, but it did not have time to pass out of the Senate. My hope is that we will pass the plastic bag ban um, this year um, and just get rid of plastic bags. Um, but after that, there's a lot more work to do. Sarah Love, a delegate from Montgomery County, has a bill on straws and on sort of small shampoo containers and whatnot from hotels. But I think we really need to start thinking holistically and getting away from the single use bill or the single item bills to a more holistic thought about this. And um, one of the things that we are studying through a work group that I've chaired called the Waste Reduction and Recycling Work Group um, and all of our hearings, we had three hearings this interim and they're all on YouTube. So you can go check them out if you're so inclined. Um, we are studying a variety of different things. One of, one of those things is extended producer responsibility. Um, so saying that producers who are you know, making all of, these, all of these packaging decisions and deciding to put three different types of plastic into one container so that it's not, there's no way you can recycle it or choosing not to use previously recycled plastic because virgin plastic is so much cheaper, saying to those producers, um, you know what, like if you're gonna do that and you're gonna bring your stuff into our state, like you're gonna have to pay for it. <laughs> you're gonna have to help us figure out how to recycle this because we cannot keep landfilling and incinerating it. So, and we're on also, by the way, we're gonna need you to actually start using recycled content rather than just using virgin plastic all the time. So I think that we need longer term strategies working with producers to balance out some of the costs um, and that are, are frankly just more holistic and get at more products all at once. Um, so I think those are some of the strategies that we're looking with. Um, on the medical waste, you know, it's a good question. I, I, I haven't heard any um, specific proposals on medical waste yet, um, but I'm sure that they are coming and we will be keeping our eye out on, um, on how we, what we can do to make sure that, um, that we are at the forefront of recycling and reusing and disposing responsibly of our medical waste. Thank you. And if I could ask a quick follow-up to that, you talked about how in 2018, the attitudes towards becoming more sustainable and reducing our single waste um, plastic, a single waste plastic has uh, changed immensely. Uh, so on that note, um, how do you think community members like me can stay in touch with on a policy level what's going on? Um, how can we become aware of what we can do uh, along with delegates like you who are trying to create a lot of change towards this issue? Sure, so what can you all do to help? Is that yeah. sort of the genesis? Is that sort of the question or? Absolutely, yes. Okay, um, great. So I was just making sure because there were a couple questions in the chat. So I glanced at them for a second, sorry. Um, look, this is a journey. <laughs> this will be a marathon, not a sprint uh, as it already has been. And so we really need people to stay in the fight. Uh, we need people to be engaged with organizations that are working on these issues like Sierra Club, like League of Conservation Voters, like Trash Free Maryland, like the Office of Sustainability, like, um, you know, in the high schools, we have um, uh, in Baltimore City, we have an awesome group, um, Baltimore Beyond Plastic, like Free Your Voice, you know, great groups that are doing important work. Um, we need you to be on their email list, stay involved, um, talk to them about how to get involved. And we need all of you to know your legislators. Um, and we need you to reach out to your legislators and to pressure our legislators to pressure leadership, right? So we say to our legislators, um, you know, are you supporting this? That's great, you are. Are you talking to make, you know, what can you do to make sure this bill passes? Like people, our legislators need to hear, everybody's legislators need to hear from them. Um, and to find your legislator, you just go to mdelect.net it has all of their information so you can be in touch with them. I'm sure they'd love to hear from you. Um, so I, I highly encourage you to keep in touch with your legislators, make it a habit of being in touch with them about issues you care about like this, but really just stay in the fight. 
share, post on social media, talk to your friends about the issues, write op-eds and letters to the editor. Um, there are so many ways to just make yourself visible so that people know where you stand on these. Then that's all to sort of advance public policy. On a more personal level, of course, just trying to live more sustainably, which can be really hard, <laughs> um, but is, is also worthwhile as well. And talking about that on social media and, and demonstrating that behavior, I think is helpful too. Um, so I think those are all different strategies and ways that you can stay involved and help push this forward. Um, and I remain totally open. If you wanna email me, call me anytime, happy to talk to anybody about how to make sure that you are engaged in this uh, fight for the long term. Thank you so much. Uh, Tarek, we have a question for you next. So Curtis Bay has the highest level of toxic air pollution in the state of Maryland. And although a monitor to track air pollution was removed in 2008, it has yet to be replaced. Given that incineration disproportionately affects communities of color, what urgent actions do you believe need to be taken in order to free communities of color, such as Curtis Bay, from such conditions? And also, what role do you think the members of these communities play in ensuring that their voice is being heard? Okay, so the first thing that, for the first question, we should obviously move towards zero waste. That would be the zero, move, uh, moving towards zero waste would answer a lot of questions. It would solve so many things. Um, also, getting rid of the Bresco incinerator because it's fairly close to a lot of neighborhoods in South Baltimore. It was placed uh, over 35 years ago. So it's a 35 year old incinerator in the neighborhood that did not ask for it and did not want it there. And um, they still don't want it there. Um, and incinerators are only supposed to live for 25 years and this is 35 years. And now it's a contract for another 10 years that's gonna be that's in those talks right now um, when we're looking on shutting it down completely. So getting rid of the Bresco incinerator would be something that we should do immediately because that would benefit a lot of people. The Bresco causes $55 million a year in health damages. Um, and it's the number one contributor towards asthma. And the what people can do to ensure that voices hurt is do exactly what a lot of people like me did, um, build community power, talk to people in your community, because once you have this power, you know, you get together, no one can tell you all, you know, you can't do something. No one can deny you what, you know, once you have this power, you have your little army. That's exactly how people like me decided to launch the Zero Waste Challenge. Um, also, we got together and came up with the Zero Waste Plan, which was adopted by the city council and yeah just pretty much building community that community power together yeah that's how you can get your voice heard awesome thank you so much and a follow-up for you would be from your personal journey if you could talk about how exactly you work towards building that solidarity within your community and leading that campaign what exactly does it take to bring people together and inspire people to stay committed for a long period of time on an issue well, once you have something that's like like me, you know, something that pretty much hits personally, like I've suffered from asthma most of my life. My sister had asthma and that's a lot of people in this neighborhood. A lot of people have the same story. So, and they also have people who die from a lot, from a lot of stuff, or a lot of respiratory issues. So since they have the same story, they get together and this is what builds their emotion. It's, they're all based off emotion, you know, because they get together and they're like, wow, this is happening to us. And it won't just happen to us because this, these factories and these companies and this incinerator is gonna stay here. So it's not just gonna be us, it's gonna be people come after us, my children. And this is what keeps the fight going. It keeps constantly going because it's a generational thing. And it was, like I said, Bresco was here for 35 years. So it's, it was here before I was here. And, you know, my grandmother was affected, her daughters, her son, you know, they were all affected by it. So it's a thing that's gonna be generational until we stop it. Um, thank you so much for sharing that with us. So we're now going to open up the floor for any kind of audience questions. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please feel free to type it in the chat. Uh, and if you don't mind mentioning your institution, uh, feel free to do that so we can mention it. But I do have some questions already. Um, 
Bridget asked, when you talk to people about plastic pollution and making sustainable change, what is the thing that convinces them that a change needs to be made? If either of you would like to speak on that in terms of maybe environmental justice or public health issues, pictures of harmed animals or pictures of polluted environments. Well, I think everybody's different. Um, I noted in the chat, I think that, you know, different people respond to different things. Um, and, you know, this shift in 2018 really started occurring after China stopped taking all of our recycling um, and our trash. And so I think that that changed the economic dynamic and that now costs our local governments much more than it used to because there's no market anymore for any of this. So I think pocketbook issues matter um, in terms of how many, how the, the degree of our tax dollars that are going toward this. Um, I also think, um, you know, certainly pictures of the huge plastic gyres in the ocean are meaningful. Um, and uh, of course, the devastation that's being wrought in communities around the country and the world, really, what's happening because of our waste. I think for a long time, there was a lot of out of sight, out of mind about plastic trash. People weren't seeing that this, you know, just because it wasn't polluting their neighborhood uh, didn't mean it wasn't polluting someone's neighborhood. And now we're also learning a lot more about production of plastic and how uh, the pollution that emits from the plastic plants um, when, when um, uh, plastic is being created and how bad it is. I mean, it's basically like, you know, let's add more coal fired power plants, let's build more plastic production plants. It's just as bad. Um, so I think that it is, um, uh, I think there's lots of different things that, that, that can and should be shared about the dangers of plastic. Absolutely. And could you talk about the extended producer responsibility bill you mentioned in the chat? Sure. So that was what I mentioned earlier. Um, the extended produce, the idea of extended producer responsibility is that producers of single use plaque, single use packaging um, need to um, pay local governments to help with the recycling of those materials. Um, and that, and they need to sort of, we need to change the markets so that there is a market for recycling some of those materials by requiring some of those producers to uh, use recycled content in their new products. So really it's about extending the responsibility or the liability mm -hmm. of uh, producers from just from, okay, we've made a Coke bottle or okay, we packaged your Amazon, um, we've sent it off, no more responsibility to actually we're gonna follow it all the way through its life from when we get it and use it for packaging through till when it's used and then recycled. And we are going to help be responsible for making sure that it gets it gets recycled. And that's not all going to be on local taxpayers and local governments. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and if Dakota, if you would like to ask your question, feel free to jump in. OK, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, one of the questions that I had is that when it comes to plastics reusability and the ability for it to be recycled and whatnot, something that I always have a lot of concern about is how the how transparent it is that, oh, some plastics are not in fact recyclable and some plastics are not in fact, in fact uh, very reusable. So I'm wondering if there's any national efforts or really any local efforts, especially when it comes to in better informing the public about which pub or which plastics aren't exactly recyclable and which ones are. Um, one of the local issues that I've had, and I'm not really sure if my camera video is showing, but that's okay. Um, one of the things that were very prevalent to me uh, living in Charles County in Southern Maryland was that often it was kind of a very confusing thing for a lot of people who are trying to recycle styrofoam, which is not a recyclable plastic, or I'm not even really sure if it could be considered a plastic. But, you know, it, that was an important distinction that just was not made clear to the community and whatnot, you know. So there was people who were forced to throw away their styrofoam and everything and just deal with it as is, even though it contributes to so much landfill waste and especially, uh, uh, you know, just 
it's just that sort of thing where I, I wish there was a bit more transparency when it came to how plastics can be handled with and managed by the community and just individuals in general, rather than, you know, leaving it up to uh, recycling plants. I wish there was a bit more transparency in understanding how recycling plants handle such materials, that sort of thing. So part of me of my uh, question was vague, but um, yeah, I was just wondering what is done about that uh, locally when it comes to plastic transparency regarding its usage and its uh, recycling. So how is the question, how are local governments handling that kind of recycling? Yes, uh, and sorry about that, but um, yeah, essentially how, how are local governments making plastic recycling and what plastic can be recycled more transparent to uh, citizens and whatnot? So every local government is different. Every local government has a different recycling contract with a different company often. Um, so that's part of the confusion sometimes. Um, but I, and I can't speak to exactly how every local government is doing that because I'm not in every locality. Um, but I think it is a problem. We were talking about that. I was talking about this yesterday with some friends, um, that it's a problem knowing what you're, what you can recycle or not, um, in depending where you are. Um, but I think that, and that labeling is a real issue. And I think somebody, we are gonna look at labeling this year in the General Assembly um, and see if we can come up with some better labeling laws um, so that people know what is recyclable. But for instance, like Baltimore City might accept one type of plastic for recycling and Baltimore County might not um, because of our different contracts. And so for a long time, Baltimore County wasn't taking glass for recycling. They weren't recycling glass, but they just got a new contract to sell glass. And so they're recycling it now. Um, but the city was taking glass the entire time. So it's a little bit hard to say um, how they're doing, how they're, be I don't think they're trying to hide the ball. I, they, they government, our local governments want you to recycle the right products. Um, but it is sometimes hard. Uh, the messaging can be difficult. Um, I totally, I think there needs to be more social media campaigns and more awareness about what can be recycled. Um, you know, one thing we saw last year when we were talking about the plastic bag ban is that there were so many um, plastic bags going into the recycling and the plastic bags ruin the recycling machines, like totally ruin them. Um, and so you have to go in and like pick out all of the plastic. And Prince George's County had hired two people to do that. And they were paying staff just to do that. So. Um, so it's very difficult. And yes, Lena's right, or Lena's right, the plastic industry has intentionally made people believe that all plastics are recyclable. Most plastics are just downcycled. They're not truly recycled um, into other useful things. And so, um, and styrofoam is plastic and it can't be recycled in Maryland anywhere. Um, so a, uh, no local jurisdiction recycles styrofoam. So, and no local jurisdiction recycles plastic bags. Um, so these are items that are not recyclable um, anywhere, and we need more clarity on a lot of that. Um, and I'm sorry, I have to jump off. I have to jump off uh, at 6.30 tonight, um, but this is great. Um, it's a great and important discussion, and I know Tariq will have a lot to share um, from Free Your Voice, and there's a lot of other groups uh, out there that are doing this work, and I'd be happy to connect you with them as well. And, um, and yeah, please, I put my information in the chat. I think it's the very first post at the top. So I hope you'll keep, get in touch with me and keep in touch about this issue because it's so important. Um, so a huge thank you to everybody for being on tonight, and thank you for organizing this. I really appreciate Congratulations. it. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Take care. Yeah. Thank you. I would Thank like you. to, can I make a comment? I'm, I'm, I'm not good at typing in and all that BS stuff, but I did make a, a, a something about the Green uh, Amendment. But uh, I've been to uh, the recycling center up in Cockinsville, and I don't know what the percentage is, but there's so much of that recycling <clears throat> that's not recycled. And that's that's one of the problems, and I don't know what the percentage is, okay? And the second thing is, I, 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 there's only five houses on a lane that I'm on, and yet I can't tell you how many people throw plastic bags in their recycling. They, they shouldn't be putting that in there. They're throwing styrofoam in there and stuff like that. I mean, it, it, it's, it's very annoying, but that was a wonderful question. And 
the recycling center up in Cockeysville, if Towson University uh, wanted to go up and visit it, you could definitely do that. I'm with the Gunpowder Valley Conservancy, and we have two ladies, two angels, that are organizing, uh, trying to promote on uh, eliminating uh, uh, plastic, totally eliminating it. And what they're doing, they're the ones that took me up there and a couple of retirement home people to uh, view the uh, recycling center up in Cockeysville. So thank you. Um, so we have another question from Kayla. Um, Trick, could you expand a little bit on where the fight on closing the Bresco incinerator is right now? Yeah. Um, so, okay, so for a while we've been, well, since I've been in school, we've been trying to get the Bresco incinerator shut down, get people aware of the contract because the contract was is up in December of 2021. However, um, not too long ago, we learned that the current mayor, uh, Mayor Young, is trying to him and I believe the city solicitor is trying to um, restart another contract. Bresco offered five years for the contract to extend, um, but Mayor Young and the city solicitor offered 10, 10 more years of Bresco. Um, and so now we're in the works of showing them that this is not okay. We've talked to council president Brandon Scott and his response to it is that there is nothing we can do. Um, mostly because he said he claims that Mary Young will only push back the more we try to um, address it. There's, he, he says there's nothing we can do about it. Even if we try to say anything or, you know, do something, it, it's nothing we can do. But however, we are, community organizers, so there's no there's no saying no to this. We've done stuff like this before. Like I said, we got rid of the world's largest incendiary proposal, so there is no no. Um, and we, we will eventually get this shut down, I believe that. So yeah, we're in a state of just shutting it down still. Um, yeah, he recently had, a, he recently came out with a statement saying different things on uh, the Baltimore Brew. And that was another reason why we have to contact them just to get some clarification on that. Um, because we, he also said that we are the, well, we, we know we're the main, we're the majority who sends our trash there. I believe we send 60% of our trash to Bresco, to Bresco, and the rest is from Baltimore County or from other places, other places out of the state. Um, and so we know we're the majority. So we stopped sending trash, just like Baltimore County did two years ago. They have no reason to operate. It, it wouldn't make sense for them to continue. They wouldn't have any enough, enough trash going there. They, and their answer, Brusco's answer to people not sending trash would, is to sue them. But I'd rather take that than pollution for 10 more years. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Um, so someone would like to know what is the fight against the incinerator, like the feeling with the fight um, amongst your peers? What are their opinions? Do you think that a lot of people are excited to take action that are in your peer group? Um, yeah, so we work with a lot of youth. Uh, I believe I'm the oldest one. Um, and a lot of them are really happy. When we first started out, they we all had the same story. We all come from the same school even. Uh, our entire, I believe our, our football team has asthma. So we, of course, we lose a lot. <laughs> but um, they all have asthma and they all, you know, like I said, we all have the same story. So they're really happy to get involved with this stuff. We work for, I've been here for two years. Yeah, we've been working for two years straight. Um, just doing things, going in and out of meetings with different people. So they're really happy. And it's not even just about uh, doing all of this. It's also about meeting different people, me connecting with a whole bunch of people. I would have never thought I would be talking to a council president, uh, mayor at all ever in my life. So just the experience of doing, you know, meeting new people and doing this work, just really inspiring. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I have I have a question for you. So, for as far as the land trust goes, how do you plan to integrate that into the environmental justice movement? Do you have plans for that land um, that directly relate to these kinds of uh, practices that we're talking about? 
Okay, I'm gonna try to answer that. <laughs> okay, so what I believe a lot of the stuff is involved in the zero waste plan because the zero waste plan was created for just for Baltimore because this is the first plan that, inc that includes fair development. Um, so a lot of it would eventually uh, be in, be involved in the environmental part of it. Um, what comes out? Could you ask? Could you ask that again? <laughs> I'm just trying to relate the great work you do at the land trust to um, the environmental justice movement in Baltimore. So I know that you guys have some like disposal bins there. Um, and also maybe you're planning on using the land to build environmentally friendly housing. Is that true? Oh yeah. So the housing will work as uh, we call it like a smart home. It uh, reduces the amount of utility costs by a lot. We work, we have different, we have our specific, we have our, our special contractors that are um, helping us build this place. Uh, we always, we meet, we meet with them constantly to talk about every, everything we want in it. Um, and yeah, so how the houses are built is that the windows and things are in certain places to make sure it stays hot during the cold season and warm during the, you know, uh, and, and cold during the other seasons and stuff. So. It works as a smart home. It's like a thermal sort of, um, and yeah. Great, thanks so much. Um, I don't know if anybody has any other questions, but we've had a really good conversation, I think. I did have a question and you mentioned something about the environmental amendment or the safe environment or whatever uh, you talked about. And I did, the question was, are people aware that uh, Maryland is trying to pass the, uh, the uh, environmental human rights, the Green Amendment? Are people aware of that? And it, it says, you know, essentially that everybody has a right to clean air, clean water, clean whatever it is. Are people aware of that? Well, raise your hands. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, the reason I bring it up is that uh, I'm, I'm working with uh, an angel, uh, um, um, uh, Rabbi Nina Beth Cardin, and she's related to uh, uh, the Senator Ben Cardin. And uh, she and a group, in fact, uh, I got a Zoom at, at seven o'clock with them, um, are promoting for the General Assembly. And, and, and that's why that uh, I, was, I was sorry that Brooke left because I'm, I, I would like her, con I will get her contact information to make sure she's aware of that. But this is something which uh, essentially builds on a, a, a something that was passed in the Maryland General Assembly in 1973 as part of the um, uh, Clean Water, Clean Air Act and the, you know, uh, the EPA was started. And so uh, Pennsylvania has one of those there. I think there are 13 other um, um, uh, states in, in the United States that have green amendment. But essentially it says basically that, that everybody in the state is entitled to um, clean air and clean water. So if, if, uh, if anybody would like that information, um, uh, you guys or, or has my contact confident information and, and let me know if you want me to send you any information on that because we're really trying to promote that okay any comments um i just wanted to comment um charles if you want to uh put your email in the um chat Right. We're going to be sending an email out to all the registered like attendees, um, and we can put in there that they could contact you about that green amendment. Okay. Because I, I would be interested in knowing more information as well. I will do that. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. If I know how to use chat, like you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. I will do that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um. So Angela has a question. Something I found very impactful from the story of plastic is how Western culture sort of dumps our trash on marginalized communities. On a local scale, we see this happen with vacant lots, local junk haulers, illegal dumping. I know this is a different aspect of the environmental justice, but Tariq, are there issues like this in the Curtis Bay area? Yeah, 
a lot. Uh, Curtis Bay is a complete dumping ground. I live in it. Um, I see it every day. It's it's sad, and it, I mean, it's sad, but it's what keeps me doing what I do. Um, Curtis Bay is a complete dumping ground. We have a medical waste incinerator. We have a coal mi- we have a coal pile that's not even covered. Um, I've talked to a couple people in my class, and they live deeper down close and close to it. They open their window, and the coal, the dust from it, comes straight into their right into their house. Um, it, it's so many things down in Curtis Bay that is just crazy. Not only is just that, but we have a lot of trash. It, there's a lot of trash in Curtis Bay. <laughs> and it's not just here, it's a lot of places in South Baltimore that's just like this. You won't find this in a lot of upper and a lot of other places that are not black and brown poor communities in Baltimore. Absolutely. Um... So one question we have for the audience, I guess, is um, what are, you, are people doing on your campus to reduce the use of single use plastics and reduce waste? If any of you guys would like to talk about what's going on in your communities or in your campuses, feel free to, for, to join the discussion. Sorry if I'm uh, butting in, but um, is it okay to just speak out and uh, tell us about what the campus is doing uh, for those environmental efforts and everything? I'll speak for Towson University. So I think this is a really complex issue. We often have to weigh the pros and cons of each choice just because we're combating convenience. You know, 75% for Towson University, 75% of our uh, population is commuters. So a lot of single use items are related to food packaging and they need to be convenient and quick and we're dealing with an off-campus population. So to counterbalance that, we've tried to implement um, moving to compostable packaging or alternative packaging for our food products. We've tried to use uh, fillable uh, compostable cups, um, but you still have your vending contracts and other contracts where you're still developed, like you're still, it's hard to break free from single use plastics until we can break free from our pouring or change our pouring contracts. Um, so that is a, a big challenge. And if we go to students and say, this is better for the environment, this is a better choice, this is why we're doing this. I feel like there's still a lot of pushback in terms of any any change that is um, offered across the board, both you know operationally and then the experience for the end user. That those are the types of challenges we've experienced. Um, we, as an institution, do a lot of waste audits just to see what we're producing and where it's coming from, and then try to find alternative outlets or our higher outlets where those products. Um, with getting buy-in from our student population. And we can put in all of the infrastructure we want, for instance, for uh, food waste diversion, not for single-use plastics, but um, we still have a challenge ensuring that we're putting, that students are, and um, faculty and staff are putting the correct materials into those bins. Um, we are seeing increases in rates. And so uh, where in the past it was incentivized to recycle. And so we could kind of leverage that, converse, that angle of the conversation with our administration. Now with rate changes, I think it's going to be a harder sell. We've even seen other um, entities, I've seen some hospitals just drop recycling altogether due to the complexity and the cost. So I wouldn't be surprised if that drives this change is that we have to look at the economics and say, if you want to recycle and we have to pay more, then we're just gonna have to eliminate it from our waste stream. And then, um... Dakota, are you from UMBC? Uh, you can hear me, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, yes, I'm from UMBC. I'm attending there. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I am um, UMBC's sustainability coordinator. Um, so I can kind of echo, uh, we're doing similar things that Patty had mentioned at UMBC. Oh, that's we perfect. Also- yeah, we're also looking at this doesn't have to do with plastics, but it definitely has to do with the amount of waste that we send to the incinerator. 30% of our waste stream is food waste. 
Um, so we're looking at expanding composting, not just in the commons or at True Grits, but also to all of the residential halls on campus. And we're talking to contractors there. We also are working on creating um, a circular reuse program. We're talking to a couple of companies, but again, cost comes up. So um, one company that we're talking to, Reapley, they um, create a platform for reuse with labs and lab equipment because a lot of that stuff just gets thrown away or there's just random list serves. So there's like a single platform and application that people can go onto at UMBC. Um, but there's a lot of startup costs. It would have a return on investment. It's just going and advocating two different departments on campus and organizing those efforts. However, that's not to say that we're that's gonna stop us from doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I would say definitely, I'm gonna put my email in the chat and you can definitely reach out. We also just recently, even though COVID just hit, banned uh, single use water from the meal plans. Um, and there's a lot of efforts last, not last semester, yeah, spring semester, that students were talking about potentially doing a plastic bag band through SGA. Um, I think just COVID hit and now everybody is so focused on different um, issues and priorities. Um, However, moving forward, I think it's incredibly important because UMBC has, you know, stated that they want to create an inclusive space, they want to be anti racist that we need to actively institutionalize that and not send our waste to predominantly black neighborhoods like Tarek. Um, so not just, you know, talk the talk, but also, you know, be thinking about how can we institutionally not be engaged in systems of oppression? Um, so definitely hit me up. I'd be interested in kind of, you know, further talking to students and making those connections between environmental issues and also systemic racism. Um, and I'll just call out like environmentalists, like in general, our sustainability office, like me personally, if I could take some responsibility have not been making those connections in the past. And so that's our bad. So now moving forward, like we got to start making those connections and that starts with these sorts of events and then kind of how we talk to other folks in our institution. Um, so that's my, I'll claim the, the responsibility on that end. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. And really, I found like there was a lot of efforts made by UMBC, at least in the relatively short time that I've attended that has been really nice to see from such a, you know, nice institution and everything. And I like the sort of transition towards the compostable um, takeout boxes when it came to the dining halls and whatnot. And I found that very effective, but at the same time, I'm wondering when it comes to the recycling of such uh, compostable boxes or the use of them in composting, does that utilize more water in its processing compared to plastics? And is that something you guys look into? Um, so my bad if that's kind of a thing that's sort of outside of the scope of this discussion, but um, yeah. Yeah, um, I definitely do wanna be mindful of time because we are at 6.51. Um, oh yeah, definitely. No, but um, I will say that I think that's kind of why the way that we look at our um, for instance, our carbon neutrality plan, we always focus on reducing energy use first before anything else. Um, and for some reason, we haven't been looking historically at our waste plans in that way. And so I want to institute, when we start looking at zero waste planning at UMBC, how can we reduce, reduce, reduce everything that we can first and then transition over to compostables? Because you are correct in that um, the beginning extraction process does use materials and resources, and we do live on a finite planet. Um, so yeah, I think it's definitely a movement that's happening within the sustainability community and definitely something that we are thinking about as well. I think this is a great way to like start transitioning. Um, so Tariq, what can we do to assist the great work that you and your team are doing? That's from Bridget. 
Okay, so you can to stay connected with us. If you have Twitter, please follow us at um, Baltimore South. Um, and you can also join our meetings. We have uh, every other Wednesday. So it would be next Wednesday where we discuss things that's happening right now. Like we discussed um, Brandon Scott and what happened with him. Uh, we discussed the zero, our zero waste agendas. Also talk about, it's not just us, it's other, other groups uh, like Baltimore Sunrise. We have different uh, zero waste groups that come in and talk about everything that's going on. So you can email us at mysbclt at gmail.com. That'd be the greatest way. Stay connected. Thank you. All right. That was great. Um, now that we've gotten our questions out and everything, I want to ask uh, Tarek one more question. Uh, do you have any closing remarks or suggestions on how we can get involved in creating a zero waste community in Baltimore and at our own universities? Um, well, just think about what you throw away and try to make sure you all practice zero waste. I launched the zero waste challenge in 20. 18. So please make sure we all practice zero waste every day. It it will be completely helpful, not to awards just the city, but specifically my neighborhood. Please, I don't want to breathe what you threw away. Thank you. All right. So thank you so much for being on our panel and for the participation from the audience. You guys are great. Um, just to close, I think it's incredibly important now more than ever to look at what we can do to support local organizations in their fight to end injustice and take, ac take action at our institutions toward creating a zero waste campus. Uh, we'll make sure to send out a follow up email to everybody who registered with the video recording of the panel and the contact information and the links mentioned in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you guys to our panelists, Tariq, thank you so much. Thank you for everyone who participated and like spoke and added to the chat room. This was great, really robust.